Welcome to track four, Mobile. This is Adventures in Bouncerland, presented by Nick Percoco and Sean Schulte. Okay, okay. Well, let's get this started here. So um, just jump in real briefly. We have a lot of content to cover. Um, we, have, we have some demos as well. Um, but really just give you an agenda of where we're gonna be going um, through this presentation. Basically, um, we're gonna talk about some of the introductions, do brief introductions about who we are and where, where we come from, talk about our motivations in doing this research, um, and, and then jump into some of the main core content of this. And we do, have, like I said, we do have a couple of live demos. Um, we're praying that the um, AV gods and the, the demo gods are gonna be with us this afternoon. But, um, but yeah, let's just jump right in. So, um, so real brief about me. Um, I've been around in the InfoSec world since the 90s. Um, really started doing penetration testing back in the 90s. Um, I formed the, the Spider Labs team at Trustwave in 2005 and um, have spoken at a bunch of different conferences. You know, it's my third time here at, at, at Black Hat and I spoke six times at DEF CON before. Um, my areas of research, um, you know, data breaches, malware, and mobile. And then also, I'm the primary author of the Trustwave Global Security Report um, that comes out on an annual basis. And you can find me on Twitter as well. My name's John Schulte. I do backend service development, but, well, <laughs> all right. Um, but I also write mobile apps, and uh, I do malware stuff for Android on the side. Last year I presented at DEF CON. This year was my first time at Black Hat. Okay, so let's jump, um, jump into, um, really talk about the problem that we're, what we're looking at. So, you know, mobile mal malware itself is, is not really something that makes an appearance um, very often to the general public. You know, I don't know the last time, I, I've never, I don't think I've ever had a friend to me and said, um, hey, my, my, my Android phone or my iPhone has malware on it. Um, general, pu general public just doesn't see that. They don't have visibility into that and they, they, they might be walking around the street with malware on their, on their phone and they have no idea that it's there. Um, usually when you hear about malware that's being discovered in say the Google Play um, marketplace or, um, or iOS, it's usually discovered by a researcher or someone who works for, a, for an AV company is typically who finds it. And for the most part, that's not the user's fault. The, uh, the phones don't have a way to really show you what's running on them. You know, modern Android phones have the little recent apps button, but a developer can choose not to appear in that list. Um, there's the, in the settings, you can find the currently running apps, but again, developers can work around that and, and not appear in that list. So even if you're, even if you're trying to be really good and, and paying really close attention to what's running on your phone, it's pretty hard to tell. Yeah, and so the other, other thing with mobile, we know that targeted attacks are happening. You know, we, we do um, forensic investigations for, um, for, for clients, and we have had um, malware that's come our way from mobile devices that have been um, seemingly targeted attacks against individuals, um, you know, things that aren't um, always happening, things that aren't, aren't common malware that you see floating around. Um, but you know, it, it is sort of, the, sort of the beginning of what we're seeing in this world of, of mobile malware, and, and, and around the corner is probably going to be some more widespread type catastrophe or some widespread type issue that's going to hit, um, you know, not just a few mobile users, but tens of thousands of users. So then also, you'll know, talk a little bit about our experience. So I talked about mobile, mobile targeted attacks. Um, you never really hear about them in the media reports. We, we, we do investigations um, a couple of times a year um, where clients are sending us devices that have, have malware on them, and that never makes the press. You never see somebody saying, well, our CEO's iPad um, um, has malware on it, and it was leaking confidential information from that CEO's iPad. Um, they don't really disclose that, and they won't, they won't go and tell the news about it. Um, so you really don't know how many go un un undetected or really how many go unreported. Um, but the other piece, you know, sort of even Android or iOS, just mobile devices in general, um, are really the first type of technology that really, I guess, in my, in my mind, really bridges sort of the, the digital and physical worlds. So I have my, you know, I have my iPhone here. Um, this doesn't really leave my person at any point in time, and it has things like, you know, GPS, it's ca GPS capable. It has a camera, a microphone. It can, you know, can do a lot of things. It has all my personal information, my contacts, everything else in it. And a record of all the communication that you, that you perform. With, the, with those people. So it's very different than, say, um, a, a PC or, or something along those lines, because it's not always on. And if I take my laptop and I and put it in the back of a car and it drives off, I'm not going to be able to track where it's at. Um, or someone can't track where that, where that laptop is. So it's very, very different. So I guess in my world, in my mind, the, the mobile world is, is getting very, very personal to the point where malware has a much bigger impact or has a, the capabilities to have a much bigger impact on mobile devices um, than they do even on the, on the PC or the desktop world. Meanwhile, for the uh, mobile platform developers like Apple and Google, 
Um, they want to get apps in their stores. They want because it, it makes them a lot of money. So in this in these app stores, Apple can keep their barrier to entry really high because people want to get in it. They'll they'll jump through Apple's hoops. But Google wants Google wants to catch up, and they've kept their barrier to entry really low for app developers. You don't have to pay as much money. It's not an annual fee. Um, it do, you don't have the two week waiting period while while they review the app. It's it, at first it just went in right away, and then later. Uh, when they found that there was a big malware problem in the Android marketplace, uh, they introduced a, an automated scanner that they called Bouncer. So we'll talk a little bit about our motivations. So I guess first, first off, you talk about Google. Um, you know, obviously, everybody knows who Google is. They're one of the largest you know, tech companies on the planet. Um, they have great search technology. Um, they have these sort of you know, futuristic research projects that are going on all over the place. But also, from an Android perspective, um, you know, I think eight, eight to 800 to 900,000 devices are being activated every single day. That's a massive population growth um, that's, that's coming online. And there are also, you know, sort of a, a footnote here, there's some analysis that was done by um, asimco.com, a blog that's out there. Um, they published that um, Android gets about $1.70 per device per year. So if you just sort of do, you know, rough math, that's about $400 million in revenue every single year that's, that's flowing in um, th th through the Android world. And it's growing as Android grows. And then we talk about markets. So, you know, historically, the, you know, the Google market, um, before, you know, now known as Google Play, um, basically is, is reactive. So if I'm a malware author and I go and I publish a piece of malware in their, in their market, in, in Google Play, um, before Bouncer, really the only way that you know, you'd hear about end users, you know, malware getting removed from stores, or getting removed from the market, was then when an end user would report it or a researcher would report it to them. Usually it would be a researcher and then Google verifies that it's malware and they, and they actively pull it. They, and they pull it off, off the apps. Um, but then new malware can come in to replace the old one and it, it wasn't effective. It wasn't, keeping, it wasn't keeping malware off anyone's phones. So I mean, when you think about that as from a, from a malware, you know, from a criminal, you know, if you have a very low barrier to entry, you don't have to wait weeks, you don't have to pay lots of money to get your um, malware into a, into a market, um, this makes it very, very easy uh, for them. And it makes the criminals happy. Um, they don't want to work very hard. Um, they just want to get the job done. So you know, the result of that is you're going to end up with you know, lots of malware and, and, and no one detecting it. And Google realized, I think, that that, that wasn't a battle they were going to win. They, they can't go faster than the entire world of malware developers. So they needed a way to get the, get the malware out of the store faster and potentially right away before it even got on any user's phones. So they developed this automated scanner that they put into effect late last year, but I only announced it in early February this year. So when we, when we heard about that, you know, Sean and I were actually chatting in our offices, and really the you know, question sort of popped into our head. We became curious, right? So we wanted to understand um, things like, now, how dip, now, now that Bouncer's in place, is that sort of game over for malware? You know, is, is malware going to get stopped every single like, time? Is it, is it going to be fully effective? Is it, is it going to stop malware completely? And then we started thinking questions like, well, how difficult would it be to get malware into, into Google Play? Um, you know, if, we, if we decided to go down that route, how long would it take? How much research can we do before someone notices us and, 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 and cuts us off? And so we, that was sort of the impetus of sort of this research and, um, and what, we wanted to, what we wanted to start looking into. And that sort of began our uh, adventures in Bouncer land. So we started from what we know about Bouncer, which was only what Google had told us. They told us that it's totally automated, it scans, it scans the, the app when it's first submitted, and then also later on, potentially based on either time in the market or popularity. Um, if it detects something that's a known exploit, it'll pull, the, it'll pull the app out of the store immediately. And it also allegedly did behavior-based checking, that it actually runs the app automatically and determines if it's doing something nefarious or, or bad, and that'll get, that'll get you tagged. Um, we expected that it was running in an emulator in Google's cloud, and that sounded like it could work pretty, pretty well. Yeah, so, it's, so I guess when you wear the, the malware author's hat, you know, so you're, you're sort of looking at it from that perspective, Google Bouncer sounds pretty scary, right? So you're, you're a malware developer, you're trying to get your malware in. They, they, it's, from, from the description, it sounds like it's going to be rather difficult. And that your old tricks aren't going to work. You can't just... You know, they found my last malware, so I'll just take the same, take the same thing, stick it in another app. You know, the, the old trick where you take a, a popular paid game, strip the APK out, and release the same game with the same name for free, and then you get, you get people downloading it. That's not going to work as well anymore. So we expected that it wouldn't work, that Bouncer would catch us pretty quickly. 
Yeah. So next we're going to talk about the research approach and process. So um, basically we had to establish some rules. Um, you know, historically, you know, even Sean and I did some research last year on Android. Um, we, had we had devices and emulators in our labs. And so it's, it's very different um, when you're doing things with, with Google Bouncer, right? Because it's, it's Google's. <laughs> um, we're, we're, not, we're not building a Bouncer in our lab. And so really we, that would mean utilizing Google's resources. So we, we basically established some rules. Um, really the first rule uh, we established you know, early on when we, were, when we were starting this research was that we were, not, we were not going to attempt to obtain access to Google's infrastructure. We wanted to actually model the same process that application developer would have to follow. Based, based partly on an idea that the best way for a malware developer to sneak past and get their malware into the store is by acting as close as possible to a normal developer. You know, your, your behavior is not abnormal. If, you br if we had broken into Google the, the bouncer server to sneak our malware through, well, they would probably notice that and, and not let that work. Yeah, so we, we, I mean, we specifically noted, I remember like the first day we were talking, we'd say, well, you, know, you, could, you could attempt to root Google Bouncer, but we decided that would probably be irresponsible and, and likely illegal. So we did, we did not want to go down that path. Another thing is that we didn't actually want to be in the business of distributing malware to users. So even though we were going to put an app that we wanted to be malware into the marketplace and we wanted to stay there, we didn't want anyone to download it. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more, and that's sort of this is the rule. We're going to talk a little bit more about what we did in order to satisfy that rule, but we really paid close attention to this every step of the way. This was sort of a big portion of our, our, our guiding our research. We, yeah, like you said, like Sean said, we did not want something to sort of go wrong and end up with 5,000 users with our, with our app running on their devices. So really, you know, we established some goals. So we wanted to establish a legitimate Android developer account. Um, we also wanted to test the bounds of Bouncer. So we wanted to see when it's, at some point in time, would Bouncer catch us, you know, see what, you know, what type of mail would get caught and what would happen, and then when would we get kicked out. Um, but we only, also only wanted to use the legitimate tools that were provided in the SDK. Um, we didn't want to try to find some exploit or try to do something that, um, like, like that, would, that would actually violate um, rule one of our, of our research. And then, of course, um, look for ways, and this, was, this became very important, we want to look for ways that we can hide um, malicious functionality um, so that if, if we submitted an application, Google Bouncer would, would look at the application and, 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 and think that it's a completely benign, blind, benign app. Again, we're trying, to, we're trying to imagine that we're a malware developer trying to pretend to be a normal developer. So we're, we, want to, we want to give something to Google that we know they're going to look at and we want them to conclude that this is a non-malicious, normal application that, we, that we're okay with having in our store. And then, of course, then the final you know, goal was to record the results and see how we could you know, make recommendations for improvement. So um, started out, so you know, the first thing we wanted to do was build a completely benign application. Um, just, we, just put it out there. We, we, built, we built an app, and we're going to show it to you. Um, basically, um, we, we, we selected one. This is sort of going with rule two. We, we selected a, a type of application that was rather common. That already exists, uh, competing apps already exist in the store, so it's not some unique and interesting thing that someone might want to check out. And also, the competing apps were either free or cheap. So if we made ours really expensive, um, that's another reason no one would want, to, would want to get it. And then the other, other piece is that we didn't want to just put together some Hello World application and submit it up to, to Google Bouncer. Something that's just a screen with no functionality that for some reason requires permissions. That, that We thought that might raise a red flag. And we didn't necessarily trust that the Bouncer scanner was completely automated. That maybe at some random time, someone at Google is looking at these apps and so we wanted the app to have actual functionality and at least pass muster on a, on a quick check, like, is this actually an app? So, yeah, so the, so the app that we wrote um, is called SMS Blocksor. Um, and basically it was an SMS blocker. And, it, and, and this is the actual graphics that we ended up uploading to Google. Um, it, we, we were required to put an advertisement um, graphic up. So this is the graphic that I, I put together that says block any SMS number. No additional carrier fees, simple block on block features. And it turns out that that's a pretty convenient app for us to do this research with because it, it can, it's an app that legitimately requires a wide range of different permissions. For example, it needs to be able to read your incoming SMS. Um, it, it needs to be able to read your existing SMS, your contacts. Um, there are a lot of things that an, an app like this could legitimately want to do with your permissions. So we wouldn't have some lame app like a, you know, like, let's say we had a, a game that for some reason needs to read your SMS. That, 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 would, that would raise red flags to the user, probably, when they look at the permissions list. So, so basically, 
you know, if, if we, we thought of the problem of, well, if we rewrite an application, a you know, legitimate application that works, you know, like, it, like, it's like it's advertised to, and we submit it up to Google, and they were, go they were gonna scan it in their infrastructure, we wanted this to potentially have some ability to, to know when they're scanning it. Because they told us that, they, they told us that it was gonna be, and they told everyone, that they were gonna do behavior-based testing, which we figured means that maybe they'll run the app. And if they are running the app, they probably have access to the internet from those servers. So what we, we needed to set, we needed to send out like a ping from the from the app up to our up to our server. So here I created a a broadcast receiver that that takes an intent, and I use an I use an alarm manager that lets me run the um, lets me lets me run this code whenever I want to. I just specify a time, and um, it'll run even when the phone screen is off. As you see the uh, RTC wake up tells it to run even when the screen is off, it's in your pocket. Uh, you don't have to do that if you wanna to try to save your, your victim's battery life. Um, but with, with, with this, it runs repeatedly on an interval and also will run when the phone boots up or when the app opens. But using the alarm manager technique allows it to not appear in the currently running apps list. Um, like when you go and take a look at what's running on my phone, it doesn't show up there. The only way to detect that it is run is if you go into the list of all apps and select that one, I'll select this particular app, and if the force stop button is activated, then it has run recently and you can quit it so it won't run again until you, until you open it or restart your phone. And so basically at this point, um, all we wanted to do is to see when Google Bouncer was running our application and try to gather some just basic information um, about, that, about that connection. So we have a, we have a demo. Um, really, this is a real quick one, just to show just you. to show you what the app looks like. There's a little bit of a, a delay there. This is so it, actually the, the app that's running on the phone so that, that's on the This table. app is running on the phone right here. You know, there's not much to this demo, we're not gonna really gonna use it. Basically, you would, you would enter in a phone number to block, and then if I was to send a text message um, from that phone number um, to this device, it would, not, it would just not show up. And there's, there's a lot of other apps out there in the market that, that do the same exact functionality. So that's, that's the app that we made, and it got, it got into the marketplace. And at that point, with no malicious functionality, it's kind of boring. But we needed to get into the marketplace first. Yeah, so you know, we decided, hey, we have this app running, works great, let's get it published. So I went and actually created a an and Google Android developer account. Um, that wasn't very difficult. It took all of a couple of minutes, um, and it cost $25. Um, to create that, um, and then also I sort of, when we started trying to prep this up and try to put it in the market, we realized we want to sell the app, um, so that took an extra step. I actually had to create a Google um, checkout merchant account in order to be able to actually even put a price. Also easy, it's just another thing to do. Yeah, it didn't take very long. I think the whole time was about less than 60 minutes um, from start to finish for me to create an account and then have the ability to publish the app in the, in the store. And then as soon as that was done, we just uploaded the APK and it was in the market as you can see there. So but, and as we mentioned, we made it expensive. We made it cost $50, and, uh, and that prevented anyone from wanting it. But we uploaded it, it was in the store, and a couple minutes later, we got a hit on our control server from Google. That 74.125 IP block is owned by Google, and is from California, I believe. And something that I thought was notable about this is that it's pretending to be an actual phone. The emulator does not claim to be a, an HTC my Touch 3G running on T-Mobile. Uh, it very clearly indicates that it's an emulator. Um, yeah, and at, at that point we knew a lot more, I mean, we actually knew a lot more about Bouncer just from that one exercise. Um, we knew that it actually was automated. It did scan within a matter of minutes after publishing the application. Um, and then um, we knew the IP addresses belonged to Google. So we didn't want to trust that it was, this was going to happen the exact same way every single time. So we actually, that was just the first time we'd uploaded it. We didn't, like maybe they just scan it once, it looks good. We needed to make sure they were going to scan on updates. So we made a trivial update to the app, no real added functionality, but we uploaded it again and it scanned us again just a couple minutes later from a different IP address in the same IP block. And as you can see, we just took a screenshot here. There's, there's this SMS. Is before they changed it to Google Play. Um, this is SMS blocks are in the, in the marketplace for $49.95. That buy button is pretty tempting, you guys. <laughs> so now at this point, we knew where, we knew where Bouncer lived. So we, we knew that much about him. So, and then we, 
but then, so at this point, we decided to, 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 to admit, you know, we're really trying to explore the way to, to hide or, or to hide the malicious functionality from, from Google Bouncer. Because we're trying to get past Bouncer, so we want to make sure that when Google's scanning it, it's a, it remains a non-malicious app. They never see anything bad. But then if you put it on your phone, it becomes malware. Right. And that's basically what we did. I mean, there was these two phases at this point. Um, and then we also, as a precaution, we actually defined sort of everybody else. So Google would, if Google ran it, um, it would not exhibit the malicious behavior. If we ran it, it would. Um, but we defined everybody else as really the TrustWave network. Um, so in so the, we wanted to make sure we had a blacklist and a whitelist. Not really necessary for real malware authors, but we're, we're trying to be careful to obey rule two. And then, you know, we also wanted, and so, you know, this is one point here, is that we, if there was a manual review going on um, we, with, with that code in there, and so we could probably talk a little, we'll talk a little bit more about this, um, but we, we turned to a legitimate technique that was being used um, by some other applications out there um, to be able to you know, make the switch so that when, um, so that we can actually dynamically turn on malicious functionality um, throughout the life cycle of the, of the app. So we realized that um, a lot of apps, including popular ones like Facebook, Netflix, et cetera, use HTML and JavaScript to form their actual application, and they put it in a native wrapper so it can be downloaded from the app stores, installed, and look like a normal app on the phone. But what this means is that the JavaScript that they're, that they're using can access the native platform's SDK and your personal data. Um, Facebook can push down an update through the, over the internet without using, um, without using the platform's update, app update, they can, give, they can give added functionality to the app, which means they're downloading JavaScript and, and executing it on the device. If they can use it for a legitimate reason, we could use it for an illegitimate reason and use this JavaScript bridge for, for, for making malware. And basically, if Facebook and Netflix can do it, that means any app that is allowed to use this JavaScript bridge can become malware at any time after it's installed on someone's phone. Yeah, and that's, a, that's a big point there. Uh, I think most end users don't know that they go and download an application today, and if they decide, well, I'm never going to update app, app, that application, um, the application is actually can be updated. Um, and, and, and it could be additional legitimate functionality, um, but as a, as a malware author, um, that actually gives you a timeline. So you can, you can distribute a, a popular application today um, and then not enable any malicious functionality into it um, from a, a year from now, if you wanted to. So we to. figured it seemed possible. And so we decided to try it. And Android actually makes it pretty easy. Uh, you just fire up a web view, which you don't have to display. We just have it running in memory. And you turn on the JavaScript bridge. Do I have a mouse here? Just say add JavaScript interface, and you give it this bridge object that... Uh, that just ha contains the functionality you want. And what we wanted to do, um, what we wanted to do was make sure that we always called this bridge object either directly or through JavaScript locally on the phone in the app's normal app, normal execution, as well as when we download, um, as well as when we download um, the various code from the internet, so that we're executing the same path, same code paths, whether if Google's doing some, if Bouncer is doing some cool static analysis of what's do, what the app is doing, or will probably do. So, yeah, so I mean, the, I mean, one of our goals was avoiding detection. Obviously, we wanted to try to get an application that, um, you know, through Google Bouncer, um, that, 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 can, that can be malicious on a young user's device. Um, so one, one thing that we did in developing SMS Bloxer um, is that for every piece of legitimate functionality, it had a corresponding malicious functionality that was in the app. And we'll actually, in one of the next slides, um, we're going to show you a chart there. But one thing we also did, um, that, that callback server that we talked about earlier, that basically essentially became a command and control server for us. And so when it would phone home, when the application would phone home, uh, and it would actually be able to dynamically download um, its instructions um, for it to execute um, when we wanted it to. So here are all the various versions, and these are all the versions we uploaded over, um, over the course of several, 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 time, several days. Um, but basically, you know, really at a high level, so you can see in that left-hand column there where it says legit, that's all the legit legitimate functionality that we included in the application. So things like selecting block numbers from your contacts. The, the malicious side was stealing, stealing all your contacts. And we also included when, um, when, when we uploaded it each time, um, when Google Bouncer scanned it and if it detected any issues with it. 
Um, and actually, one thing to note is that phase three, which was um, see your phone number, and then it was complete phone recon, um, for whatever reason, during that test, um, they never scanned us. Um, and it was still published in the store. And we decided to go with this somewhat iterative approach step by step because we wanted to see if there was one of these that, that Google would catch. Like, all of a sudden we're, we're have this new photos functionality or, or reading all the phone records. Are, are, is that going to stop us? Or if we if we just given it if we just done it all at once, we're not we're not going to get all the information we wanted. We kind of expected that one of these steps, like the hijacking the screen, which doesn't really have a reason to exist, or the DDoS attack at the end, we thought that would get us caught. So we didn't want to have that in the in the original published app. Of course, it didn't get caught. Um, so here's a, a quick screenshot of the interface for our, our control server. We're going to demo that. In a we'll little bit. show that in a little bit. So then you know, we went through this whole process and, and as you can see in that chart, um, sort of the final, the final functionality was sort of this denial of service um, functionality that we can actually tell um, someone running that app to send a, send a, a lot of connections to a host. Now obviously one to one isn't very exciting. You know, it was, if it's only one app, one phone running this and you decide to send you know, 10,000 connections to a website, you know, big deal. Um, but in, in the real world, when these, this malware gets you know, deployed out there, malware like this gets out there, um, you're not talking about one user running it. If it's a popular game, it could, you can end up with you know, lots, of, um, lo lots of end users. I mean, apps, apps get popular. I have an app in the store that has, that has 55,000 active users. Um, just regular people can make, make popular apps. But we, we hadn't originally planned to have the hijacking the screen and the DDoS functionality in it. We thought we'd get caught before that. So after nothing else got caught, we were kind of brainstorming, well, what else can we throw in there? They have to catch something. So after they didn't catch those, we decided, well, we need to step up our getting caught game. So we removed the, the bouncer blacklist and submitted another version of the app, just a small tweak that was the, it was the complete app, but it served the malicious payload to Google, and it executed that, that payload on the bouncer scanner. And it, it still, still didn't, didn't work. And they didn't, still didn't catch us. Um, so, so we decided to be even more aggressive. Um, instead of calling back out to the control server every 15 minutes, we decided to go down to every one second. So um, we submitted an app that as soon as they open it, just starts slamming the, the uh, net, sl just starts slamming the network with all the device's personal information. It's uploading the photos, it's, it's uploading the contacts and phone records and everything. And Bouncer noticed that that was happening. Uh, you got very us, angry. It scanned us a bunch of times. Like the, the first scan, we got several calls back. And then six minutes later, and then it stopped. Six minutes later, after nothing had happened for a few minutes, it scanned again. Again, stopped after just 30 seconds. And then went away. But it gave us some kind of cool information because it had contacts, one of which was the White House. Uh, it has a phone number, which I assume is fake. And what I thought was interesting is that this this emulator is running, it, it claims to have a SIM serial number. Like the actual Android emulator that I have, a lot of this is null. It doesn't have a phone number or a, or a SIM card. But then 24 hours later, we got this. And that, second scan, that first scan tipped them off. The second scan was some sort of verification. And a day later, they pulled the app from the store and terminated the developer account. So this is what happens when, Google, when the bouncer actually catches you. Right, and one thing to note is even when that scanning was going on, it was about 24 hours um, until we received this um, email, and so during that time, it was still in the store. Um, during so that, even when the app is is caught and is verified to be malware by, or at least heavily suspected by a bouncer to be malware, it's still in the store for, in this case, twenty four hours. Right. So now we have um, our sort of the SMS blocks or evil demo um, that we're going to go through, and this is um, what we have. And I, just to give you a sort of setup here, we actually have a, a device here. Um, Running, um, running SMS Bloxer. This is actually the only device that ever bought that that copy of um, uh, of Bloxer. I paid forty nine ninety five to get it onto this device um, through that process. So we're going to show you a couple of things. We have um, um, obviously the phone here, and you could oh you are, you've already seen the phone, seen it running, and it's not going to do anything. This, this this runs in the background, so the the phone itself. It can be off. It's just on the on the home screen. The, the phone itself is doing nothing that the user can see. So now, well, right now we have it checking in every five seconds because this is demo mode. Normally we wouldn't want it to, to ping us all the time. That would 
probably not be good for the user's battery life and they might notice. So one thing you can notice at the, the bottom of the screen, that's it actually checking in. And so this will auto refresh um, as it checks in if everything's working correctly. You sort of always pray. And you can <laughs> see that it, it has an X now in the recon box. So it checked in, it, it sent us phone recon information. So we fire that up and we see that this phone has a phone number, voicemail, we, we now know the SIM serial number off the phone, the, the device ID. So that's kind of cool stuff. And we know the IP address it's coming from. In this case, I think that's AT&T because we're tethering to the iPhone to get internet in here. So now we can turn on some other functionality. Turn right. on contacts. Say so now we want get to some, get some contacts. We'll wait for it to ping, ping that back for us. Yep, there you there go. go. So it grabbed contacts as well. So here's some phone numbers. We're uh, scrubbing them for you so you don't start calling us. We could turn on phone records. And I've actually been using this phone all week um, here, in, here in Vegas. So I've been, if any Spider Labs members are in the audience, um, if you got text messages from some stranger who was, who was asking you lots of questions, that was me from this test phone. So we wanted to get some, some SMS conversations going on. So in here, as you can see, there are some, um, there's some phone calls. Android doesn't, uh, for some reason, record the calls and let you upload the audio, but we know who and when you, you made and received calls. So we could but it does keep a record of all your text messages. So that's the next thing we're gonna download off this phone. Yep, so it should be updating shortly. There and there you go, now we got all four. So here are a bunch, here are a bunch of texts that Nick was, was texting people all week. Just pulls them right out. Incoming and outgoing. Yeah. So the other interesting thing, we're, we're also able to grab photos off the phone. And want to, there's also not a, we don't actually ask for that permission. Yeah, I never had to ask for photos permission. That just came along with something, but we can grab photos without, um, without the user ever seeing that we're gonna use photos in the permissions dialog. I was kind of surprised by that. It seems, it seems like an oversight. That's me preparing for the talk. <laughs> Give it on random. Yeah. And then one thing to note, if you see in the, over on the right hand side, you see that five there? Um, that's actually, um, it, when it checks in, it actually records then the next time it should phone back in. So we can change that interval. Um, we can have it checking in every hour, and then we wanna start doing stuff, changing stuff. We can tell the phones, start checking in every minute for a while, and then we can switch it back when we've gotten what we wanted to. So then the other, the other functionality, and so there's some random photo from here. So the other functionality that um, we thought would be pretty interesting, um, this comes a little bit from our, our, a talk that we gave last year at, at DEF CON, um, where we talked about a, a vulnerability in, um, in, in Android called um, a focus stealing vulnerability. So basically, um, what, what Sean's going to do, he's actually gonna put a, um, a URL um, into this hijack, and it's gonna send it down to the device next time it checks in, and without the user sort of interacting with the device, um, it's going to just pop up a web page on the, on the user's device without them really knowing what's going on. And it's popped up here and it refreshes. So we can send, we can send all those users, all those phones to whatever website we want to, uh, essentially whenever we want to, which opens up some interesting stuff, like if it comes out that there's a new WebKit vulnerability that we want to use to, that we want to exploit to root your phone, we can just send your phone to that site without you having to click on anything and, and, and use the exploit. Yeah, so it sort of creates an interesting concept in, I guess, mobile malware. You're sort of future-proofing your malware. So you add this functionality with, with hopes that there is a... With no knowledge of, of any existing WebKit exploits, but then when one is discovered and before it's patched, you can immediately send this out to everyone. Right. And then the other thing you could do with this, obviously, you can send, you know, an end user just opens up their phone and they, and they see a login page for something. Um, you could, you, with hopes that they're just going to enter in their login information. It's possible, right? Yeah. And then the last bit of functionality that we added, and this is where Sean was saying that, so we actually, I think you could, you could shell into that, into that server, but we actually created um, basically botnet functionality, what we called botnet functionality. So we sort of envisioned if this, if this became a, if we say wrote a, a popular video game or something, and, um, it, and we published it in the store, and then a day later, um, basically um, it gets two users, and then a month later it's, you know, 5,000 users, and then a few weeks later after that, it's, it's hundreds of, you know, hundreds of thousands of users. 
Um, you now basically have a whole bunch of mobile devices that you can then direct to run a um, basically a denial of service attack against um, against anybody you want. So we wanted to put that functionality into there. Are you? Yeah, your AT and T connection is not helping my SSH. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, there we go. Uh, we just told it to start slamming this this website. And, uh, if you can see the seconds number occasionally changes, it's sending a lot of requests right now. I think it's designed, we designed this to send what, 12,000? It'll send 12,000 every time it gets a check-in, and right now it's getting a check-in every five seconds, so it's sending a lot of requests. at and is probably gonna complain about that. <laughs> I'm gonna stop doing that. Yeah, so the other interesting functionality, just at least in this command and control, um, we're able to do things like clear all and turn everything off, and so, uh, if you turn everything off, the next time it checks in, which should be in a couple seconds, um, you'll actually see the X's clear out. So it, it will stop sending its functionality. And, and, and the thing to note, um, on, this, on this phone here, there was, without, uh, besides that hijack functionality where you actually saw something pop up on the screen, this phone's been sitting here and the app hasn't even been opened. Um, and nothing, there's no indication at all that, that the photos were taken, the contacts were being taken, that text messages were being taken off the phone, or even the, even the DDoS or the, the denial of service launch was launched. Um, basically, you can imagine an end user, and this is what we were talking about at the beginning of this talk about visibility, an end user could have this on their phone and would have no idea that this functionality is happening, this, these activity is happening on their device. It looks like the phone is a little swamped right now with, with doing that, that DDoS, <laughs> but um, before we go, I, or go on, I just want to show what it's downloading here. This is the, um, this is the JavaScript that we're sending down to the phone. Um, right now, I've turned everything off, so I'm telling the phone to stop sending me the phone info, stop sending me the contacts, stop sending me the, the photos. Um, but if I had turned it on, it would, tell it, it would tell it to send it. And note here that it happens in the on load, so as soon as the JavaScript downloads, that this code will execute. And usually, if we're not sending anything malicious, the only thing it says is set the number of seconds till the next time I check in, which, it holds in, which the device holds in memory. And here we go, it looks like it's finally come through and, and turned off. So it, it caught up and managed to download, the, download it. So go back into the presentation here. So um, you know, really what we learned about Bouncer is that everything that Google said was true. So you know, everything they said about the analysis, about you know, it being automated, and we found that to be true. Um, but then through our research, we found its main weakness is that malware developers can design their malware to not execute when it's being run by, by Google Bouncer. Because we know that Google's going to scan it when we upload it, so we know not to serve anything malicious then, but we also know where they're scanning from. So even if we had been serving malicious, a serving malicious payload, well we know that if you're coming from 74.125 you shouldn't see that. And so we just have on the server, don't ever send it to them. So if they're gonna, if they're gonna scan the app again after it's gotten popular, they're still not gonna see that it has anything malicious in it and they're not gonna see it doing anything malicious. I mean, if you, even also if you think about you know, the concept of this JavaScript bridge um, being used, it really allows um, developers to really bypass the whole certification process of an application. So you know, if, you, if you consider just an, a process of a pre-entry review of an application and someone puts a, a seal of approval on it, um, it's now, being, um, it's now uh, able for users to download. As a, as a developer, I can say, well, you know, it was certified, or not certified, but it was checked, and it's, it, was, it was allowed with this functionality. Well, a week later, I could just dynamically change that functionality. That's completely. basically the point of, of Google requiring the code sign, and then when, they, when you download the app from, from Google Play, you get a, it comes over HTTP, the app itself is not encrypted, but there's an HTTPS connection that after it finishes downloading, the check that asks for the signature, and then Google Play tells you the, the signature of the app, verifies that the app has not been tampered with, the functionality has not changed, this is, this is the app, this is the functionality of the app that was intended to be there, and we've scanned it and, has, and have found no malware. That's the point of that. However, any developer, and it's not hard, I mean, there's no big trick here, can get around that code signing and can execute whatever, whatever code they want to, whenever they want to, just from the internet. So we, 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 talk, we, we sat down after we completed this process and thought, you know, what are some ways that, that, that a, a bouncer type system can be improved? And, and, and there are ways, right? So a better bouncer would consist of other entry and, and, and endpoint evaluations. And so when you talk about endpoint evaluations, we talked about visibility and the control that end users have on their phones. 
Um, they have no, the end users have no ability to verify or, or even identify if there's nefarious activity going on under the device. And not only the user, it would be hard to train the users to search for malware, but it would be useful if, the, if some sort of malware scanning were happening on the device, that if a part of Bouncer was running on your phone and if suddenly an app changed what it had ever done before and started uploading your contacts to, a, to an unknown site, that it might report back to Google that this app needs to be checked out. And is, the, are, is this happening on other devices also? Right, right. So the idea of, of, of requiring developers to submit something like a, like a, like a functionality map of their application um, that then gets verified by a bouncer system and then passed along down with the app to the device so the device can self-police um, that that activity is going on, just as the scenario that Sean just spoke about. I'd also like to see it, you, that behavioral testing seems to only run for about 30 seconds. I mean, if you're going to try to be really simple about it, maybe you just not activate the malware for five minutes and then the behavioral scanning never catches that. We didn't bother trying that, so maybe that doesn't quite work, but these are, these are things that I hope the Bouncer team is, is evaluating. Also, it would be helpful if, the, if they scanned from different places. It, it was always scanning from the same IP block, and, it was, and the IP block is owned by Google. If they, if they I don't know, talk to AT&T and Verizon and we're getting scans from them, well, we couldn't just blacklist that because then we're cutting off actual victims. Right, right. And then the other, other, concept, other idea is, you know, the JavaScript bridge, that, that capability must be strictly limited. Yeah. We learned a long time ago, and by we I mean everyone, that downloading unsigned, untrusted code from the internet and executing it with full permissions on the device is a terrible idea. And they should be working to prevent that from happening, essentially ever. So I guess we, we have some conclusions, um, some things in conclusion here. So, you know, you know this is not just a, a problem for, for Google and Google Bouncer. You now, there are lots of other app stores out there today. Um, there's, there's enterprises, I, I talk to, you know, enterprises on a regular basis who are planning on building their own you know, private app stores. Um, the U.S. government has is, 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 is built their own private app store. So it's, this is not just a Google issue. The, the, the issue is that if you're only going to um, scan applications um, at entry, um, or, or and not be able to have visibility down at the end user's devices, this problem will continue, continue to exist. And, and the other piece is, you know, applications, application markets with automated malware detection, um, if, the, if the malware authors are, um, spend enough time, or they, they spend the same, same amount of effort that Sean and I spent um, on, this, on this research, um, they actually can, you know, they will be able to beat an automated system. And we realized at the end of this testing that there's no reason they couldn't beat a manual check too. If you never supply malicious functionality to the app, then a manual reviewer is just going to see your app. And in our case, they would see that it, I mean, is kind of crappy, but that doesn't stop a lot of apps from getting into the app stores. Right, right. And, th and then the other, I guess the final conclusion is, you know, really pushing the industry towards um, doing this type of detection on the endpoints themselves on the devices, um, because end users need to have visibility, in, or at least have devices that have visibility into what's going on within these applications, um, or this, this problem will continue to consist, exist as well. So basically, Google's done a good job. Bouncer seems to be effective, but there's always going to be ways to get around it. In order, it, there's, a, there's a lot of functionality that's possible on an Android device, and with that, with that power comes a, lot, comes a lot of ways to use it inappropriately. Right. So I think with that, we think we have some time for some questions. A couple of minutes. Yeah. No, no. no. Um, there was no notification to, to us as, a, as an end user, I guess as a customer of SMS Bloxer. Oh, sorry. Yeah, his question was when, after we got kicked out of the Google Play market, um, um, did any notification get sent down to our device? the device that actually bought the app? And the answer is no. So as, as a customer, if the application was found malicious and pulled, um, it, would, um, it, would, it would basically, as an end user, you had no indication that that was going on. Yeah? The question is, did we submit the app to another app store like Amazon? And no, we didn't. The, uh, we should have, but this was a talk about Bouncer itself, not app stores in general, although that probably would have been a good idea. Hey, yeah, question over there. Test, test. 
No, we didn't. The question is, did we try to reactivate the account or create a new, a different account? That Google actually says in the termination letter, um, don't bother trying to to uh, um, to reactivate it or don't bother trying to resubmit it. Um, you can appeal uh, your termination, and then we'll get back to you. But I, I, mean, I actually did. Happens. I actually actually did attempt to appeal um, and never heard anything back. <laughs> Sounds about right. No, it never it never made it into our account. So, yes. We did not. Uh, the question was: Did we create another account and submit the same app again to see if Bouncer um, developed a signature of that of that application and, and knows it from now on? No, we didn't. We uh, we couldn't get. We couldn't get anyone to volunteer to give us their, their Google account, and, um, <laughs> and I don't think we wanted to start creating fake identities or anything. Hi, this is uh, Zach Lanier. Uh, number one, if, if Google does actually pull down a malicious app uh, from users' devices, they will be notified. They'll get a notification saying it's been uh, revoked remotely. Uh, but my question was, uh, did you find cat.jpg? No, we did not. Were you aware of cat.jpg? Yes. Excellent. Um, I have sort of a, a broader question. Isn't the underlying issue here something that a piece of automated testing stuff like Bouncer can't really resolve, that the Android permissions model is far too coarse-grained and that it doesn't really do anything like track the creators of data and require data creators to authorize data users? I mean, there, there are full-blown machine simulators in Google Play, and you can't imagine they're going to take down every copy of SimAge and so forth. I mean, how can anything like Bouncer ever work with the security model the way it is? I think that's a much larger question that I don't think I'm prepared to address. In terms of running Bouncer on the actual phones themselves, um, Okay, obviously that's not possible right now, but did you try any of the tools like Lookout or anything like that to see if those would detect any kind of malicious behavior on, uh, for the tool itself? No, we did not. Okay. Yeah. Just curious. Google obviously used your app. Do they pay for it? <laughs> no, they don't. No, when, when the scanner runs, they don't, they don't pay you every time you upload, it, upload an update to the app. It actually doesn't show up that, it, that it, it's ever been used. So it, for, for a long period of time, it had zero downloads, even though they were scanning it. Which, I mean, I would expect. That's how it should behave. Uh, for the hijacking functionality, uh, why would you want to send a user to a malicious web page to exploit a WebKit bug if you already have code execution? We don't have um, full code execution. We're just sending JavaScript that can interface with the existing SDK. Um, being, able to, being able to root the phone gives you more power, and that's not something that we attempted to do with this app, and right. our, and wouldn't try to, and we wouldn't try to get that past Bouncer. I mean, popping WebKit's not going to get you root either. <laughs> so, kind of on the same lines, I mean, I would imagine with the current model that Android has, malware authors might want to pull down stuff. Um, I think I've seen where people were pulling down Rage Against the Cage or whatever, um, or the X-Ray app that uh, John Oberheide just released. Um, <laughs> um, so I almost wonder, you know, why would you even worry with this JavaScript bridge when you can just pull down arbitrary binary blobs that, you know, there's no code signature checks and just run whatever you want? Well, there's always two ways to skin a cat, right? That's true. I, mean, I, I just feel like, you know, that's another interesting vector that Bouncer should check. I mean, how many legitimate apps are going to be pulling down a binary and executing them? You know, AV apps might pull down a signature, but they're not going to execute the signature. So. Well, games will often pull down extra artwork. I mean, it. Do you execute JPEGs often? I mean, I get your I get your point though, right? Like there are things that are going to get pulled down, but I feel like there are some things that are behavioral that Google could probably also pull uh, pretty easily. Like preventing it from being able to execute the, the code that's downloaded? Yeah, I mean, it could. Or it could at least flag it for manual review later. Um, it's not a foolproof thing, right? Because you could just send a JPEG or, you know, if it's from Google. But just, just thoughts. 
There was a question over here. No. Yeah, so the question was, once our application was removed from the marketplace, did they remove the malware from our device? And the answer is no. Well, we can't say for sure that it didn't get remote killed. I assume it did, but we were running a test version of the app on the phone itself. Right. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah, question in the back there. No, they, they, they did not. Sorry, the question was, the device that we downloaded and purchased it on, did it get removed from that? And the answer is no. Yeah, question. Um, I would say that JavaScript that's downloaded from the internet and is untrusted and unsigned shouldn't have as much access to the SDK as it does, that maybe there's some way to make it so that it can change the way the interface looks or change around the functionality without, without accessing the, the contacts database. The JavaScript shouldn't get access to that. And I don't know about implementation details or, or if there's a better way to do that. But that, that would be my first pass at a, at a piece of advice for them. Yeah, he was asking, asking about the, um, why we got kicked out or why they caught us. And it seemed like it was, you know, he, he mentioned it seemed like it was because of the frequency of the requests. Well, I'm guessing it was because that behavior seems clearly malicious that as soon as the app starts, it just repeatedly uploads all your contacts and phone records and SMS records every second. Um, that's something that the bouncer absolutely should flag as, as malware. We were we were trying to we were trying to get caught with that one. Yeah, we could. Well, I guess we can discuss that. Um, we, we we had not made it publicly available. Yeah. Well, it's tough to say um, because we only got caught once and it was when we finally made something that just needs to get caught. So as he alluded to, it could be just the huge amount of network traffic or just uploading the, the personal data repeatedly. Um, but without more testing and a lot more apps and a lot more Google accounts, it'd be impossible to say that we know um, with any certainty what, what Google is actually looking for. Uh, you should um, start practicing your JavaScript bridge. Oh, at, could he, what should he as a malware author take away from how he could make better malware? Well, yeah, the question was, why didn't we get the, the cat.jpg? Um, that, that, you know, during that test, the information that we showed you was what we got back. Um, we don't know if that specific instance didn't have that image on it, 
um, we don't really know why we didn't get it back. Um, we, we get we get images back from from our from our real devices, but we didn't get an image back from um, from the from their test device. Well, it asked for um, the external storage and got the list of got the list of photos. However, it may make a difference that we didn't ask for photos permission. So we were getting photos that were available without permission. Yeah, well, we weren't reading the SD card directly. Yeah, it just uses the, uh, it allows you to execute the Java code from JavaScript. So the JavaScript can do what the Java code can, but it doesn't, it doesn't um, escalate. Sorry, can you repeat it? Outside of the bouncer system that caught it, yeah, we don't we don't know. We we sort of define bouncer as the system itself. So if Google has some other controls in place that are looking for that traffic or, or something that's what caught it, it may have been. I would imagine that they would define that as part of bouncer. Was that a cute joke? No. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't know if we could see evidence of that, um, but we assume that it was happening. Is that all? Seems to be all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.